it is already recording. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's um, <clears throat> let's just create a context. Um, uh, this uh, interview uh, will be uh, reformatted as a uh, a book review interview dialogue for the Journal of Contemplative Inquiry. And um, just so that you understand, the audience for this is uh, hundreds or possibly thousands of faculty from all over the world who already have some interest in contemplative education in general. And that's defined very broadly. So we have people who are uh, religious in a wide variety of religions, people who are not religious, but consider themselves spiritual, people who are more secular in their pro approach, maybe a little skeptical even of using the word spiritual, but interested in uh, self-inquiry and in the potential for uh, transcending selfish interest. So you have a wide variety of people what they share in common in this journal is some interest that has been expressed somehow in contemplative education. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the background for this. So um, in the interest of full disclosure, uh, uh, Eshwani invited me to uh, contribute a chapter to this book. Uh, and I uh, agreed to do that. And in the process, I, of course, began to learn more and more about uh, meditative inquiry and Ashwani's approach. And we had known each other for several years before, but this experience really deepened for me uh, what it was that Ashwani uh, not only was promoting, but it was what he was doing. And uh, I was able uh, at one point to witness him in the classroom. So I thought as an editor of the journal that it would be uh, of great interest to many of our readers to uh, explore this further with the author in a, a book review interview. And so that's where, that's the context for this. So um, let me begin with a question for Ashwani. Uh, many people are caught uh, between uh, uh, education that is purely based on uh, good reasoning and critical thinking and people who believe that Education can also uh, include or at least tolerate uh, different types of faith. And uh, just beginning with that question, how do you relate to the issue of faith and reason or faith and science? Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a that's a very good question and I think that's also a very broad question. See the way I view I think I'll have to explore it a little bit in dialogically and that's why I did want to see the questions right because there is a fresh insight into it. So the way I view science as is uh, an exploration of the world right we have a desire to understand how the world works how our body works, how we think, how we understand, how we learn. And, and it, the, the, the scope of questioning can begin, can range from, uh, from uh, atom to the whole existence of the universe, right? How the universe function, where it has all come from. 
So I think science has approached this question uh, outwardly. It wants to go outward and through that it wants to understand how the world work. But the basic thrust is that we want to know what is behind all this or how uh, all of this has come into existence and, 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 and what are we doing with our lives, right? I think when the question of faith comes, that's a little bit, uh, it's like, as we say, as, as we can see, it's an kind of an opposite of science because it relies on what we want to believe in or we, what, what we consider to be true. Even if we may not have a, any scientific evidence for it per se, uh, but something that we want to believe in, like there are thousands of people on earth or millions of people who believe in God, right? but they can't provide a hard evidence for that. But it is something that they are either conditioned to do so, conditioned to believe into, and people become, may become very fanatic about it too, because uh, we can see the way the faith uh, systems have evolved, they have become quite divided. And every faith seems to think that their faith is better than everybody else's faith. Mostly that I have seen that happen. And that has caused so many problems and, uh, uh, conflict in the society. But there are also people who intuitively sense something, subjectively sense something, but they can't necessarily prove it in a scientific or in a, uh, or, or in a, in a way where they, they can offer to the world, here is the evidence for the existence of God, right? So I see that th these are the two uh, uh, to, you could say, like uh, ways of approaching our existential quest. One is a scientific uh, quest, which is more after, as you said, reasoning and collecting the evidence and, and, and proving it step by step. And the other is kind of a leap of faith. You believe in something and you are just happy with your belief. Having said that, I think, uh, uh, one important point, point that uh, we should also uh, consider in this, that science is also kind of rooted in faith because you have to have faith in a particular process and particular system uh, through which you gather the evidence, right? And we see that the science have also been evolving. It's a constantly evolving area where uh, certain ideas, certain things become concretized and they begin to act like faith. So we are not ready to hear anything else other than what we have come to believe through scientific exploration. So this is how I look at science and faith. So what was your question, David? Can you can you remind me what did you want to? Oh, I just asked it broadly. I just said, how do you relate to that um, apparent dichotomy? And I think you have uh, sort of defined the dichotomy, but. In the context of education, particularly uh, our audience, which is primarily higher education, uh, how do you approach a um, holistic uh, education, an education that you describe even in your introduction as having spiritual dimension? How do you approach that when it would seem to um, mm -hmm. possibly encroach on uh, someone's uh, religion and uh, certainly possibly, uh, well, certainly possibly, I would say possibly actually, <laughs> uh, uh, threaten the separation of church and state which in Western education has been uh, a dominant force mm -hmm. to overcome the uh, religious uh, bias of previous generations. Mm -hmm. well, in, yeah, in, in so as, yeah, I think you're very right that. Uh, uh, a key focus of meditative inquiry is, is spiritual exploration. 
and uh, but the way i look at spirituality at least the way i think is is not something that encroaches upon uh, anybody's religion it can but that is not my intention that it approaches anybody's uh, religious convictions or uh, religious uh, beliefs the way i approach uh, spiritual inquiry in my classrooms is through uh, self understanding so the questions that we engage with and uh, the the activities and the 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 interactions that we engage with to, to me they we don't need to invoke any religious beliefs in order to do that for ex- but they may be part of some religious traditions for example uh, often i ask students to do an exercise in the class where i would say okay take uh, a piece of paper and a pen and just put down on the paper whatever is happening in yourself whether you are thinking about something you are feeling about something no matter what is happening that is not important what is important is that you write it as honestly and as authentically without even worrying about whether it is grammatically making a sense whether it is a proper constructed sentence none of that is important just put your whole being on the paper as you are experiencing in the moment right so to me uh, this is one of the ways in which we get to connect with ourselves and what's actually happening in the moment and often my students tell me that they have never been offered this kind of an opportunity where they can actually connect and it's not a usual meditation where you are sitting you are asking to concentrate on breath i do that as well but i start with activities which uh, which doesn't kind of create a resistance because a lot of people have ideas about what meditation is how they should be doing it a lot of people come with the idea that they already know that they are not good for meditation meditation doesn't work for them and this is an exercise which i would say 99.99% of the students have really uh, shown a great interest in because it seems to be working for most of the people so through this exercise like and and then i deepen this exercise as well now okay so sometimes i do it right away sometime do it in the next class now do this exercise again and see what are the things that have been on your mind just circle them and then explore them a little further so to me this is a form of spiritual inquiry because it is helping you understand yourself you don't require any religious uh, belief in it you don't require any religious conviction in it you don't requ- you don't you are not required to follow it to the end of your life or to f- to have faith in it and then ultimately you are going to get some results out of it it's nothing it's a momentary and a in the moment exploration of what is happening inside you and i think i might have discussed with you and you yourself do a bunch of them i have developed a lot of exercises like that uh to understand or to help my students understand their own inner selves and structures and its relationship to the uh, to the world so like w- another exercise that i do is asking students to put down any questions they have on the paper it can be any question it can be a question about uh, why am i on earth why is there discrimination anything anything that can come to your mind is good and often students say that when they have put it down they feel a sense of relief because there has been a lot of things that have been going on inside of them but even they didn't have a, a connection with them but when they are allowed to do something it just begin it, it just comes out so this is how i approach holistic education so i don't feel that it encroaches on any religious or spiritual convictions having said that just there is a little caveat if there are people who are very um, uh have a strong faith in their religion or in their spirituality like i have seen uh, often people say is this a buddhist meditation am i becoming a buddhist by doing this that happens very rarely and uh, and and then i say no you don't have to be anything it's if you see the value in this exercise try it once if you see value you can continue it it's your exercise and you can change it in in any way that you think will work best for you 
Great. Okay. That's 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 really helpful. Let me um, inquire further um, about um, what you're calling exercises. And uh, let's make a distinction, which I know from your work uh, you make at length, the distinction between uh, techniques and instrumentalism and uh, meditative <coughs> inquiry. Because uh, although you may be offering many different types of exercises, you don't regard these as meditative inquiry in and of themselves. So could you just speak to that? Because I think a lot of people in the audience tend to think that the practices themselves are some kind of uh, special techniques that are uh, necessary to uh, achieve the knowledge that they think they're going to achieve. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that's a great question, David, and I think we have talked about it uh, in uh, on other occasions as well. So I'm glad that you have brought it up. And as you see that I've, uh, I've uh, critiqued this idea quite a bit uh, uh, based on my understanding of uh, Krishnamurti's work and my own exploration. Often people, when, the, when anybody hear the word meditation or even meditative inquiry, the thing that comes to their mind is, okay, I'm sitting somewhere on a cushion and my eyes are closed and there is either some music going on or some sound uh, te technique is being invoked or I have to look at my breath or I have to visualize something, right? So I think that's, as you have said very well, it's a, it's a very limited understanding of uh, meditative inquiry or meditation because what we are doing is, so as an experimentation, I support it. If somebody is drawn to, I really want to observe my breath. If you're drawn to it, then it's a great exercise. You experiment, you explore, and you try to find out what this whole observation is. Why is this important? But often these techniques are invoked as uh, sacrosanct in themselves, as if they are the truth. And if you follow them religiously, day after day, year after year, you are finally reach, uh, you will finally reach some kind of a state or enlightenment or something, right? This is how uh, in, in most of the literature I have seen that people, that, that this is how the techniques are invoked. So when people are approaching them, they are probably approaching them from this perspective that, that uh, they are ultimately going to lead you to some point if you religiously and consciously continue to practice them. And I think what the problem that I see with it is then that it becomes technique focused and there is a instrumentalism applied. And, the, and, and the, I think its biggest danger is that it is also shown to improve concentration, to improve uh, um, well-being. It reduces your stress, right? So it can be co-opted by uh, uh, capitalist and uh, corporate world. Oh, this is great. And like uh, a lot of people say, if kids do it, they, they will have uh, less symptoms of ADHD and they will be able to concentrate better. Their uh, memory work will improve, their efficiency will improve, and they will do good on maths and uh, English tests and, and in education in general. So like based on your own study of Buddhism and based on my own study, I think that the, the purpose of meditation is much deeper and broader. It is not just to gain some instrumental results, but is to develop a deeper understanding of yourself and deeper understanding of life so that we can see how our egos, individual and collective, create such a mess in the world. How, what kind of a life style we have adopted that is causing so much havoc on the earth? Is it possible to, to touch the fountain of compassion within ourselves to, so that we relate with each other in a very different way? So th there is a very broad and deeper purpose of meditative inquiry. And there is a very instrumentalist purpose of meditative inquiry. 
now in the kind of the world we are living in it's the instrumentalist purpose that most of us are interested in and that's how it is sold that there is see it's not only um the other things that have instrumental value this is also instrumentally carry can be very valuable to the well to the betterment of your life and to me then it loses his whole purpose for me meditative inquiry is very uh, very broad and uh, its its breadth is uh, quite extensive as i've tried to and i think the new book that we are discussing here this is the first time i've talked about it that meditative inquiry is personal that it can allow you to understand your uh, psychological structures yourself in relation to the other but then it is also social because you don't exist in isolation you exist with everybody else and everything else and uh, its epistemological orientation its ontological orientation its capacity to be critical of the uh, social structures and the injustices that are embedded in them right so i've tried to show uh, to the best of my capacity given the space uh, available to me that it is not just about doing exercises although exercises can be a really important part of it but it's much broader than that its scope is uh, quite expansive and in and it's a holistic view rather than an instrumental or technical view so what would you say then uh if uh if if i said that uh, uh sometimes in order to approach this deeper more transformative purpose people may need first to come to a sense of uh well-being or healing or um peace first so that then they have the openness to look at these more fundamental questions these more existential issues mm -hmm. which they may take for granted to begin with but then once they they settle they can begin to experience the the the, the meaningful uh their meaningful relationship to these bigger questions and that's where their identity comes into the picture and the whole sense of self or you referred earlier to the ego and so is there an issue there that for some people the entrance might be instrumental but maybe later it becomes more existential or um you could say um exploring the ontological issues of pure being mm -hmm. the, that deeper level might become available to them mm -hmm. more likely when they have already settled themselves again yeah i think it it depends on the person right and it depends on how we are approaching it how we are approaching something so i think it's perfectly fine if somebody says first i need to take care of myself i need to understand for example i am going through this crisis i need to first uh, get myself out of that crisis and i think that's perfectly fine i think but we also need to uh from the very beginning we need to pay attention to how we are relating to anything so if uh, so i should be aware of it whatever action i am taking or whatever i am approach i am taking uh, towards myself there has to be a sense of awareness it like i i should not be doing it in an like in an elusive sense that i am instrumental now and tomorrow i am going to become existential mm -hmm. the very idea the very understanding that i am instrumental in the moment is existential so when i see my instrumentality in the very beginning that is an existential process to me the, the deeper inquiry have already begun because i see that i am doing this something for an instrumental purpose as long as i see it 
I think it can have a lot of impact on the way you approach it then. Okay, excellent, thank you. I think that's, that was very helpful. Um, so just to play uh, a little bit of devil's advocate here, for, for those audiences who have practical issues, let's suppose theoretically, uh, we have an administrator in an educational institution who has uh, budget issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, what they want to do is pay attention to what students are asking for. And they want to provide them with uh, offerings that will lead them to what they at least initially think is important. So they may offer, a, let's suppose they say, all right, we're going to expand our business school because many students are interested in business. Mm -hmm. We will get the best uh, faculty who have demonstrated success in business and we will help them as much as we can, but then we'll get them to teach students about the uh, uh, primary issues in developing a, uh, uh, a, a market economy and uh, the techniques and the, the um, uh, methods of going about and creating a successful business, management, MBA programs, executive leadership programs, all of which have enhanced the revenue stream for many higher education institutions, which previously kind of, uh, you know, kind of uh, looked down upon those types of concerns, mm -hmm. taking a more elevated, and I use that in quotes, uh, elevated arts orient, liberal arts and philosophical orientation. Now, if I'm an administrator and I come to this book because I see there's a, there's a significant issue around mental health in my student population and even in my faculty population. And I'm wondering here, if there's something that should be more centrally uh, incorporated into our university mission that we need to look at. Now, I hear the, uh, the holistic aspect to what it is that you have said, and it appeals to me personally, but how do I incorporate this when what students are demanding in terms of offerings are courses that are going to be uh, personally appealing to them, either from a pop culture point of view or from a career point of view? What am I going to do about that? Mm. Well, I, I think there are, there, there are so many things that you have said and I can respond to so, so many of them. I think first of all, this uh, corporatization of university is very problematic in my view, because then it, uh, it puts all the burden and that is the central to neoliberal reforms, right? It puts the burden of uh, sustaining an institution on the institution themselves. So you're forcing them to become uh, uh, private corporations. And of course, when you become a private or corporation, your primary significance is how are you going to balance your budget? So how are you going to get more and more money? So of course, it becomes uh, primarily about the programs that are going to uh, uh, get more money to the institution. Having said that, uh, even if that is true, and that is our reality, although in many parts of the world that is not so many European countries fund their educational institutions. I'm sure they pressurize them in some other ways. Uh, even if that is, the, that is the issue, why can't ethical thinking and contemplative thinking be part of 
business uh, education as well why do we need to see business as only concerned with money devoid of any ethical or contemplative or sustainable orientation i'm sure there are a lot of uh, business scholars who bring in these questions uh, into the matrix as well that it is not about preparing students to fit into the economic system but also helping student to see the problem of the existing economic system and the and the relationship that it has formed with the ecology and try to change that relationship i think that should be part of the business education as well if we are truly providing a good business education that, that's an excellent response and i think it goes a long way uh, but tell me even in your own experience the um, attitudes of people in the liberal arts uh, toward the people in who teach uh, management sciences or business and commerce what is the relationship of faculty, not only the administrators, but the faculty in regarding the uh, business and commerce with these broad generalizations and uh, you know, cynical views of anything that appears even to be mm -hmm. of societal benefit? <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you find that in your institution? For sure, I I think I think the people who are uh, rooted in uh, critical theory traditions and the Marxist traditions, they often see uh, pro professional programs like business and law and education as uh, being primarily instrumental instrumentalist because they bring money in, and they are not necessarily questioning uh, the deeper problems of the society, right? But there are a lot of people who see the the other side of the coin as well. That within these programs, there are folks who are uh, looking at these areas from more critical angles. So I see both. There are people who are completely cynical, and I don't uh, um, blame them for that because th th these programs are offered right as that that they are more marketable uh, professions. They are going to bring more money and more donations and more endowment to the university. So they are essential for the sustenance of the university. But on the other hand, uh, uh, there are also folks within these programs who are very critical as well of those programs. Although in my uh, limited understanding as well, I think the number of those folks would be less than the number of people who are just going along with the, the flow of in the way economy wants them to perform or, or in the way economy wants them to structure their programs. But I did want to respond to your other question as well. If an administrator is seeing the significance of it, right? Or if a school principal is seeing the significance of it, or even an instructor is seeing the significance of it, how they can allow it to become more uh, widely recognized. I, the way I would approach it uh, would be, I think a lot of people, especially after pandemic has realized that what isolation means, what depression means and how widespread it is, uh, how the, the problem of internal problems and the relational problems, uh, the domestic abuse and all that, right? So people know that human beings are not just economic and political units. They are also psychological units. They're also existential units. And there is a lot of things that happen within and around them, which we uh, conveniently or ignorantly ignore. We don't think that it exists. So I think what you're saying is if somebody realizes that, wait, there is something very much more powerful that happens inside of us and unconsciously between us, and we need to pay attention to that. I think people are already realizing it as, as an ad administrator, I would first show it to the people why I do take an interest in it. I will maybe hold forum uh, and have a discussion on it, invite people and have a broader discussion. What is this problem and why is it important to pay attention to it, right? And as I see, based on my own experience of having uh, conversations in my class and outside of the class, I, I haven't found 
many people who don't see the value in contemplation in understanding yourself so if we present it right and by that i mean present it authentically when people see that this person is not only talking about contemplation but is actually contemplative then they see the value in it right so the, like a lot of uh, of my students say you talk about dialogical pedagogy and your classes are also dialogical but there are also a lot of people who talk about dialogue but their classes are lecture driven so if i embody contemplation and meditation then people see it and uh, and just one more point along with it if everybody doesn't want to uh, partake in it or explore it i think that's perfectly fine too maybe they the, it it is not uh, probably the time in their life that they are seeing the significance of it yet that's good that's good okay that's really helpful so um sometimes we we may have touched on this but i want to go further with it from a particular uh perspective uh there are there are many people who look at the uh, structure of a larger society and the so-called democracy that we're in and what they see is uh, almost the opposite of what it's at least in print intended to be they don't see um uh, the freedoms ensured by democracy and uh they don't see a meaningful participation uh, of themselves or people like them and they feel historically uh they have been unfairly marginalized uh treated with racism um uh largely unconsciously uh even so that it's not just um the um explicit um behavior but the implicit behavior which is the uh condition that they can't seem to uh have not been able to penetrate or shift so some people talk about this by saying well you know um it's very discomforting for people who have power to say well okay sure we're we're going to give up power and uh and recognize that we have a lot of unconscious patterns that have produced suffering um uh, when you see that an administrator or a tenured faculty person uh winds up feeling uh kind of backed into a corner uh do you expect them to just yield uh to your truth uh or the truth when it would mean for them oh now i have to give up power so how do you approach it not from the point of view of someone who has been traumatized by all this but from the point of view of the person who is in power and who's now realizing oh my goodness what what we really mean by decolonization at least here in canada is a real offer of so co-sovereignty or sovereignty or some kind of uh sharing of power now it's that's challenging mm -hmm. so are people going to be having to face this um uh this this is ease the sense of oh i'm i'm not just going to accommodate and help these other people i'm going to have to literally give up some of my control mm -hmm. how do you now take that person's point of view and create a dialogue mm -hmm. i i think that that's a uh, tremendous question david and i think uh i i would say definitely in canada uh we are grappling with this question now and and anywhere in the world where this uh, uh 
uh, where this recognition is finally descending on the people that uh, uh, while I think the earlier you talked about the democracy, right? So that's true that the world may have become more democratic, right? And there have been more uh, uh, possibilities for people who have been marginalized, who have been controlled to find their way, to get some space, to, 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 uh, to, to get out of the cycle of injustice and, and uh, find their place in the society. But at the same time, uh, democracy is also uh, have shown that there are a lot of people who have control in it. The businesses, like the 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 COVID nineteen situation, has clearly shows the pharmaceutical companies don't listen to anybody. So the companies and the corporations have a lot of power, uh, and then the, there are politicians, and then there are the dominant groups. So even though the the democratic movement has grown. But that doesn't mean that uh, the injustices and the operations have completely stopped. I think we have to realize that that in any freer kind of a space, uh, there is a possibility of uh, uh, challenging the injustices and the operation, but uh, oppression. But also there is also the possibility that the dominant class and the nexuses will exert their influence on the society. So this dominant class or this dominant group i think is quite threatened by the movement that is growing because it is bringing out uh, more and more the oppression and the injustices that have existed right so in that i would say there are people who don't care about it okay whatever is happening is happening then there are people who are threatened and who want to control it like donald trump but then there are also a lot of people uh, who feel or who realize that, gosh, this injustice has happened. Like a lot of uh, students in my class, because I uh, uh, focus a lot on indigenous issues in Canada in my curriculum theory courses and holistic education courses uh, and educational theory courses. And some of them say, we couldn't have believed that this actually happened in Canada supposed to be the most peaceful, friendly, happy-go-lucky kind of a country. And this thing has happened. There are so many graves that are being uh, uncovered now. And these students who are pre pre predominantly white are going through this like internal uh, tumultuous kind of a state. What, what we inherit this, uh, this history and what are we going to do about it? So I think uh, as you are saying, it will be difficult. And uh, the, the, again, not selling it, but th that's where meditative approaches and contemplative approaches can be really, really helpful because they not only help you see uh, what is happening within you, but also helps you come in touch with uh, a, a more uh, deeper movement within yourself. Like Buddha has talked about it thousands of years ago, right? You have the foundation of compassion, fountain of compassion within you. So uh, unless we, un if we only look at it politically, economically, historically, and from the perspective of power structures, I don't think we will be able to make a real uh, uh, progress, real movement ahead. But if we look at it from the perspective of relating with each other more compassionately, more ethically, uh, because we have a deeper connection with each other, then the decolonization or, uh, or the reformation or the change or the transformation may appear very differently. So I would say that should be the foundation of the dialogue, how the dialogue can be facilitated there has to be a recognition and everybody is not going to recognize. A lot of the people just will ignore that whatever is happening is happening. We don't care about it. And that's, it's a huge population. Some can't do it because they are stuck with the poverty and so much uh, life uh, activity that they don't have time to think about it. Then there is a powerful group who doesn't want to give up the power, but these people who are more sensitive and seeing it and feeling quite conflicted inwardly, I think there is a lot of potentiality uh, or possibility with these people to have a dialogue with them rather than blaming them and then 
uh, uh, see a lot of students say how can i talk about indigenous issues i am not indigenous how can i talk about afrocentric issue i am not uh, afrocentric and then i say but you can start from the perspective of learning about these issues like nobody will say why are you learning about indigenous cultures and world views so if we even begin with the perspective of learning that there is a diversity there are different ways of knowing and at the same time also look inward to connect with your very deep internal self which uh, a lot of teachers have said and i also believe in it is the self of everybody we are all connected with it so can we find connection not only outwardly but also internally with ourselves and with everybody else i think that would promote the dialogue that you are speaking of okay that's good that, that, i think the um, the book you you've written captures and expands uh, uh, on this and uh, i think it's important to include that this is not a, a book that is just reiterating your own personal point of view but please say something about your motivation to creating a book which is an edited collection of a very diverse group of authors yeah I, and I'm, i'm glad that you asked that question david i was going to speak about that because uh, up until now readers might think that or the listeners might think that this is only my book but this is actually a collection of uh, writings where uh, folks from a variety of disciplines and cultural background are engaging with uh, my work on meditative inquiry and that's exactly the reason why i did that because since i have uh, begin working uh, on this idea of meditative inquiry more formally it has been present in my life uh, for a very long time but formally i started when i started writing my doctoral dissertation and since then i have experienced a kind of a, a dialogical engagement with it from uh, many angles and, and and from a lot of people so then uh, an idea occurred to me why don't i invite these folks and see how they can relate to the idea of meditative inquiry from their own vantage point so there is a chapter Uh, on afrocentricity and meditative inquiry uh, there is a chapter on indigenous thinking and meditative inquiry and your own chapter on mindfulness and meditative inquiry and other folks have explored it from legal perspective uh, from dialogical teaching perspective from uh, heideggerian and dewian perspective so it it just allowed me to do that and allowed us to do that to engage with each other in a dialogue and i i think that that's what you were talking about right how we can facilitate the dialogue i think the dialogue can be facilitated when we are interested in each other's perspective so i i just opened that uh, kind of a venue and 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 uh, just hope that it would work because people had expressed interest previously and i think it worked very well that's excellent that's excellent so um I'm going to uh kind of throw you just to conclude here we're almost at an hour here. Um uh this is a bit of a curveball but I I'd like to conclude with your comment on a short quote from a famous uh, poet W H Auden uh who said if I can remember it correctly truth like love and sleep resents approaches that are too intense mm -hmm. what my reading of uh, that uh, uh, poetic thought is is that whenever you try to impose restrictions on something whenever you try to uh, lay a path which is too rigid which doesn't have possibilities which doesn't have openings it often uh forces people to resist to not see it or uh if they are not strong enough or if the their uh, particular group is not allowing them to be strong enough they just adopt it as it is so either there is indoctrination 
and then repetition of what the tradition has told you or there is a resistance and rebellion without even understanding what the tradition is about so uh, like this poet i would say there is a great beauty in keeping things open and flexible and approaching uh, things more gently and opening the uh, this this particularly this area of meditative and contemplative exploration uh, more gently and tentatively and hesitantly and uh, more openly rather than trying to impose it on people otherwise there will be either indoctrination or resistance wonderful that's great that was well done okay i uh, i feel satisfied that we've got the basis for uh, an important uh, interview book review and um uh, i i could uh, stop thank you well, let me thank you first because i think i your question uh, drew me so much in the first question that i forgot to thank you thank you for taking the time david to to not only contributing the book to to and for your willingness to do this interview book review kind of a uh, uh, dialogue uh, with with each other i really appreciate it i really enjoyed it and thank you for the opportunity it is my pleasure even my privilege uh, to be able to do something like this and i hope that there can be continuation and follow up for sure definitely okay thank you